Today we're going to be looking at possibly one of the most famous topics in psychology, classical conditioning. But first, a quick word on what it means to learn. As a child, learning is seen as gaining skills and information, like learning how to walk or how to read. As an adult, learning might mean something different, like enrolling in a course, you know, to get a qualification. But in psychology, learning is a lifelong process. It's anything in which our behavior or response is changed in a long lasting way. In the next few lessons, we're gonna have a look at three forms of learning, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational or social learning. But first, can I invite you to enjoy this little bit of On music? On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a bed. Now, I don't know about you, but listening to this music just makes me feel happy. Not gonna lie, it's actually been a pretty stressful week for me, and listening to this music is legitimately making me feel more relaxed and happy. Why? Well, it's probably making me think about the holidays, you know, about Christmas shopping, about buying and giving presents, about my kids around the Christmas tree. For you, it might make you think of, I don't know, going to the beach, backyard cricket, you know, the sound of Christmas music, it's just music. And it might be different for you, but for me, I've developed a bit of an association between Christmas music and being in a happy mood. And the thing is, no one on earth is naturally born with these two things linked except for maybe Buddy. But because I've learned to associate Christmas music with being relaxed on the holidays, presents and all that stuff, what used to be this neutral stimulus now brings about a response. In psychology, we would say that I've been conditioned. And so classical conditioning in psychology is the process by which an organism can passively learn to show a naturally occurring reflex action in response to any stimulus. It's really learning by association. The response isn't even something that I really have control over, which is why it's described as being reflexive. Now, an association is what we would describe as being a learned connection between two or more objects or events. And of course, the man everyone thinks of when it comes to classical conditioning is this guy over here, Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist. So he did a whole bunch of stuff, but his most famous work had to do with dogs, saliva, and bells. Allow me to explain. So, in this experiment, Pavlov found that if he presented food to dogs, they would start to salivate in anticipation of eating that food. Nothing mind-blowing here, this is just a natural response. Next, he picked a neutral stimulus that had nothing to do with either of those things, which was bell ringing, and of course the dog didn't salivate in response to that. But what he did next was to pair those two stimuli together, and so he would present food to the dog at the same time as ringing the bell over and over and over. And of course, because food was part of this, the dog would salivate in response to that. And finally, after doing this many times, Pavlov took the food away and this time just rang the bell on its own and found that what used to be a neutral stimulus now became a conditioned stimulus because the bell on its own caused the dog to salivate in response. Pavlov even found that this worked on other neutral stimuli, such as a tuning fork or a metronome. This is in essence how classical conditioning works. It's all about learning to associate something neutral with something that was natural. Now I mentioned a bunch of terms just then going through those three phases, so let's just take a moment to break it down so that we understand what we're talking about here. Here are the five terms I mentioned before as part of the conditioning process. So the first one, an unconditioned stimulus, or a UCS, is the stimulus that naturally causes the UCR, the unconditioned response. In the case of Pavlov's dogs, it was food. And therefore the unconditioned response, or the UCR, is the natural response to the UCS. So the dog salivating. So far so good. This is just a natural response that the dog already had. Then Pavlov introduces the neutral stimulus, the NS, which is something that would cause no natural response, the sound of the ringing bell but by pairing it with the food, eventually the neutral stimulus turns into a conditioned stimulus, a CS, because of the repeated pairing. So now the sound of the ringing bell has turned from a neutral into a conditioned stimulus, and now the conditioned response is the new developed automatic response to what was a neutral stimulus, which is that the dog salivates. We can use these five terms to describe any time in which conditioning occurs. And in fact, why not? Let's use this to think about the example I gave before about me listening to Christmas music and suddenly feeling happier. Pause this video for a second and see if you can think of what the examples would be of those five terms. So the example I gave before was how listening to Christmas music, really any time of the year, puts me in a happier mood. So those two things must be the last two examples. The conditioned stimulus is Christmas music and the conditioned response is the happy mood. As previously mentioned, there's no natural reason why Christmas music should make me feel happier, which means that Christmas music prior to the conditioning was a neutral stimulus. My unconditioned response of being in a happy mood wasn't because of Christmas music, but because of the fact that 
It was holidays, it was the Christmas season, presents, shopping and all that stuff. Understanding these five terms and how conditioning works is going to be pretty important in year 12 psychology. But you know, it's worth appreciating just how technical Pavlov was with his research, and maybe more so, how amazing those poor dogs were. Also, imagine how much fun it would have been to count drops of dog drool. Yup. Although I should mention that Pavlov did treat the dogs in ways that many wouldn't be happy with today. To him, it was just science. But it does raise questions about the ethics of such an experiment. An even more stark example of this was an experiment conducted by John B. Watson. So in 1920, Watson carried out what is probably one of the most infamous pieces of research in the area of classical conditioning and psychology in general. A nine-month-old child, who we now call Little Albert, was chosen because he had never been seen to cry. Watson let Little Albert play with various animals on the floor of his lab, such as a dog, a rabbit, a little rat, which Albert seemed to enjoy. But whenever Watson made a loud noise by striking a steel bar with a hammer behind Albert's back, that would frighten him. So Watson decided to hit the steel bar whenever Albert played with the rat. Initially, Albert was just startled, but after a number of pairings, he would start to cry. Eventually, when the rat was presented to little Albert with no noise, he would cry and try to crawl away from it. Now, this is a clear case of classical conditioning. There's no reason why the rat would make Albert cry, but because it was paired over and over with a really negative stimulus, it eventually was associated with that negative response. Now, as interesting as this experiment was, it's been slammed by a lot of people as being highly unethical. I imagine that for some of you, hearing about little Albert would make you feel not just upset, but even sick. What since little Albert experiment is used as a case study, a reason for why ethical considerations in research are so important. One of the most important considerations is that no physical or psychological harm should ever come to participants as a result of the experiment. But that clearly happened to little Albert. Watson also failed to obtain permission from Albert's parents, as Albert obviously could not have provided consent himself. This is one reason why almost all psychological experiments today need to be approved by an ethics committee, even if it seems totally mundane. There is almost no chance Watson's experiment will be approved today. Talking about this honestly gets me quite upset, but I guess I know what to do to lift my mood. In the next video, we'll talk more about how associations made by classical conditioning can get extinguished or later recovered.